in the early years of the renewal, when the Council Fathers, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, decided to once again bring the liturgy and its prayers back into the vernacular, into the common tongue of the people, which, of course, is multiple tongues today. There was the guiding principle for translation that the Holy See came up. It was a document called Comme le Provois. And the guiding translation principle then for the first translation of Pope Paul VI Missal that came out in Rome in Latin in 1969. That basic translation principle was don't worry so much about each individual word from Latin into the vernacular. Rather, concentrate more on the meaning, on the meaning of the text. So the original translation into the vernacular was never intended by this guiding translation principle to be a literal translation from the Latin. And it had the blessing of the Holy See. And it was a genius thing, I think, on the part of the church, listening to the Holy Spirit, to make that the guiding principle then. Because people did not know what they were saying when they responded in Latin. And so it was important not so much that we translated each word, but that we got the sense of what we were doing. I'm sure you remember, I'm sure you remember coming to Mass in those early years when what was not comprehensible became understandable. And how that must have, I know, I don't recall that much about the Latin, so my diet, my spiritual diet for public prayer was most, I mean, I do remember some of the Latin, because uh, I went to church all the time as a child, but, but I remember, I remember more the English. But I'm sure many of you well remember the Latin. That was the guiding principle of translation up until 2001. Now, it was Pope John Paul II who decided that he wanted to have a new missal because he had canonized a whole bunch of new saints. He had, the, a bunch of new saints had been canonized. And so we needed to include these in the missal because they weren't. They were a bunch of little handouts that we would get from the national office, and it was a mess. So the Pope wanted to have all that in one binder, so to speak. So in 2000, he does his new missile. Now, you may remember, in 2002, we had all these uh, changes in the rubrics, where the extraordinary ministers stand, uh, you, we're not supposed to use the ambo except for the proclamation of the word and, and those things. Those things came first. The translation was not yet. After the Pope issued his new missile in 2000, he decided, under the auspices of uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he decided that he th thought that it was a good time to change the guiding translation principle for the Latin texts. And I think he made a right decision because I think that in his mind, people now get it. The meaning is rather clear. So in 2001, the Pope wrote another document wherein he said the new guiding principle for translating the Latin texts will no longer be what was called the dynamic equivalency, just aiming at the meaning. He rather introduced a formal equivalency, 
meaning a more literal translation of the Latin words. No longer did the, the Holy Father want the Latin texts to be paraphrased, he wanted it to be translated exactly. Now, as a side, what's very important for us who speak English to know, particularly in America, there are many countries who do not have the resources nor the personnel to translate from Latin into their own language. What they would do is they would translate the English text that was used in America into their native tongue. And so what was happening was our translation that we're using now, not the new one, but this one, is a step removed from the literal Latin because the meaning is the important thing. Then this translation of another language is a translation of a text that's based on meaning and not the literal word. You see, so, so these countries that don't have the resources or don't have the personnel and expertise were working on a document from a document that was not literal. And so the Holy Father recognizing that, and it, it seemed like he was picking on us, why do we have to be so exact? But that's the stewardship of the wealthier countries. So our text will be exactly translated from the Latin. So those countries that use our text in English to translate into their vernacular, it would be just like using the Latin. So that's one of the things that, that we've had to really step up to the plate for, is to be good stewards and to help our brothers and sisters. Now, let me just tell you that this process of translation was not without a lot of consultation. The English translation of the Roman Missal, third edition, will be used for all the 11 English-speaking countries. Now that's new, because right now, the missal that's used in England or Australia or New Zealand or English-speaking Canada is different than ours. But now, all of the 11 English-speaking countries will use the same translation. And that was a very difficult task. Now, this is the process. After the Holy Father, in 2001, issued that document for the new principle for translation from Latin into the vernacular, in 2002, the International Commission on English in the Liturgy, it's, it's nicknamed ISIL, prepared the initial English translation of texts for the English-speaking bishops' conferences. The bishops got the first draft in 2002, and it was with a green cover. That's what we called it, the green, the green book. Then each bishop, each bishop in his diocese, in these 11 English-speaking countries, was given the opportunity to make comment upon the translation. So it was Bishop O'Donnell then who asked me to gather a, a, a little group together and to go through 
the Green Book. And so I had some priests, I had some Latinists, I had some English professors from the university, and we all sat down. I had some women uh, there too, so it was a very broad spectrum of people. We sat at the cathedral center, the conference room, and we just read. We read through it, major parts of it, and we would make comment that this, meant, you know, the Latinists who were experts in Latin said, well, maybe this might be a better way of saying it, et cetera, et cetera. And so then that, those comments were then mailed back to ISIL, to the International Commission on English in the Liturgy. And they looked at that in consultation with the Holy See and another group called Vox Clara, which was a commission of, of uh, linguists and theologians who were experts in the field, and they were representative for the Holy See. They looked at the comments, and they, then they proposed another text, which came in a gray cover, and that was called the Gray Book. And that year was... 2008. So from 2002 to 2008, consultation was happening. Then, in 2008, each national bishops' conference of these 11 English-speaking countries got this gray book, approved it, and upon each conference's approval, the gray book became a white book, like the white smoke of the Pope. And then that was sent back to the congregation for divine worship and the discipline of the sacraments. And then the recognitio, the recognition by the Holy See, the permission to proceed was given. And that came in 2010. Now, this was very challenging. It was very challenging for the English-speaking countries because we have different words. We have the same words, but they have different meanings. For instance, if you go to England, to London, and you say, hey, give me a lift to the grocery store, they're going to look at you like crazy because a lift in England is an elevator. So we have that to contend with. So it's, it, was a, it was a very, very difficult process. But we're here, and we've got it. Thank you for tuning in to this special on the New Roman Missal. Please join us next week on this station as we continue this three-part series. If you would like to view this program again, you may find it on our website on www.dioleaf.org. Go to the Office tab and scroll down to Radio and TV Ministry and click on Tell the People. We hope you've enjoyed our program because it is produced for you.